And welcome back. It's so good to have Dick Bramer again with us here on the Twins Wrap. Derek Hansen with you. And again, brought to you by Jefferson Lines. And, well, Dick, I don't know what more to say. This is a weird way to kick off this season of the Twins Wrap with you. And, and uh, boy, just a couple of weeks ago when I sighed down at spring training in Fort Myers, the world was a lot different. Yeah, it's unfortunately where it is right now. And there are so many things more important to than this. I, we all acknowledge that. But the fact of the matter is this is – for most baseball fans, it's supposed to be the most exciting time of the year with the uh, dawning of the new baseball season. And unfortunately, we are where we are. We'll hopefully get to that point. We just don't know when that will be. Yeah, it's for sure. Now, I left right when things started getting weird. I mean, and, and the fact that the NCAA was kind of got things going by saying there wouldn't be fans at their uh, at the NCAA tournament, then the NBA uh, suspended its season, then the NCAA canceled the Final Four tournament, and then really the ball kind of got rolling there. Were you still down in Fort Myers when they decided to shut down spring training? Yeah, they decided to shut everything down on Thursday, and I got the first flight out of town on Friday. And it just so rapidly changed when we were down there. You know, gradually we were told, well, we might be playing. You know, the first road trip was supposed to be in Oakland and Seattle. Well, we might be playing there, but there won't be any fans in the stands. Then we heard, well, we're going to play those games, but they'll be in Arizona. And then, really, I think what what forced everyone's hand was when the NBA uh, had to. Uh, you know, uh, suspend at least the rest of their season. And then we all anticipated that, well, it's just a matter of time. Baseball's not going to be starting on time. And sure enough, the next day they made what was certainly the right decision uh, to take a step back and hopefully only one step back and, you know, pick things up again when things get better. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate on so many levels. And again, we've got much, much larger concerns than the start of a baseball season, but Twins fans know very well this was probably the most anticipated start to a season than we've had around here in 10 years or so. So we'll hope to get to that point when we can talk about more enjoyable things than uh, you know whether we have broken our social distancing and things like that. No, that's true. And you hit the nail on the head because I was talking to a few of my friends you know, that lived down in Florida You know, when I was down there. And also kind of live in areas. And as you know, I, I drove down there and back when I went. And even in a state like Tennessee, where it's not really green green yet, you know what I'm getting at? I mean, winter still hits them and not like it does up here. But once those uh, once everything kind of gets changing as far as, uh, you know, the flowers start blooming and all that and you start to hear and watch Twins baseball, you kind of know spring is here. So it's going to be odd because, as you mentioned, Thursday was supposed to be opening day. And for a lot of us, Twins baseball goes along with that springtime feel. Yeah, I'm looking outside my window here at home now, and you can see some signs of spring, but I'm not used to seeing them this time of year. Usually I'm either in spring training or ready to start the season. We were supposed to be uh, in Oakland, or more specifically, I guess, San Francisco, getting ready for the, the start of the season in Oakland, and we just hope that, uh, that things uh, get better in time to have a season, a substantial season, and then everything we're, we were anticipating – being fired up about here uh, at the end of March, hopefully we'll be able to feel that feeling just later in the year. It's got to be tough for, as you mentioned, not only the fans and what they're used to, but you know the, the Twins players, there's such a routine with these guys, right? Off-season workouts. Then they show up at Fort Myers. Then they go through spring training and then games. And then it kind of comes to an abrupt halt here. It's going to be interesting to see the approach if they do start to you know, decide on a date that they want to get the season going, how much of like an extended spring training that they want to get before they actually play games. Yeah, it's uh, again, we don't know when the season's going to start, and then within that they're going to need, I would think, at least two weeks. Uh, some have said they need a month. You know, the pitchers, starting pitchers that were building up uh, you know, four or five innings are going to have to start from scratch again. The one thing that I think could very easily happen when we get started, and let's just take the optimistic view that we will get started at some point. When we get started, Derek, I would not be surprised if the games were played without fans in the stands. That would at least allow the game to be out there, to be viewed on television and listened to on radio. Uh, and then the, the, the teams, the, the industry itself would get some revenue uh, in again. I mean, that's, you know, this is like every other business. If, if there's no product, you're not going to get any revenue in. And then uh, after the season would get started, I can imagine there would be uh, 
a lot of split doubleheaders, expanded rosters to 30 or more players to allow for doubleheaders to be played on a fairly regular basis. Uh, off days might not even exist. They'll try, once the season starts, to condense as many games they can into a shorter period of time in the hopes of having a representative full uh, regular season. Yeah, it might be tough on your voice, but I've been I've been clamoring I've been clamoring for day night double headers on Saturdays for years, especially in the summertime, and I think we might see a lot of that coming up here if they do get the season going. Well, hey, you know, let's say Memorial Day, and that's just an arbitrary figure, and that might be, might be overly optimistic. But if they get started uh, by a Memorial Day, basically they would try to get as many games as they can into a four month, maybe five month period. Uh, I've been jokingly, half jokingly, tell uh, telling people I don't know if I'm going to get a deer license this year because we might still be playing baseball in early <laughs> November. No, that's a very good point, uh, Dick Bramer, with the television voice of the Minnesota Twins. Let me ask you, and it's brought to you by Jefferson Lines, the Twins wrap. You mentioned that I think you and I are on the same page because I had a conversation with someone who just thinks that most sports are going to get blown out until the fall, and I said, you know, I think for as the CDC kind of goes by guidelines, it's all going to be kind of what they say, right? It's 10 people now. Now, if you can gather with a group of 30 or whatever, that'd be okay for the Twins Clubhouse. No fans to start. But I think to get some normalcy in, in America, and you and I both being baseball fans, you would agree, one of the big things is if they if people could watch or listen to baseball games, that would be huge. Well, I know because I've been at this long enough to remember – uh, that baseball was very much a part of the healing process after 9-11. It meant a lot to baseball fans and non-baseball fans to have the games played because it was a signal that things were returning to the new normal, you know, the new normal that we all still experience after the, the attacks on 9-11. And, and I've, I've tried not to look at this so much selfishly as what it would mean whenever the baseball games or hockey games, NBA games are, are being played again. And, and I specifically think about uh, the people who are in senior care facilities because my, my both my parents went through the progression of you know senior living. And I know how much baseball means uh, to the residents of nursing homes and the like because it's uh, new entertainment every day and it's something that most fans can relate to. And, and so, again, this isn't a selfish hope so much, but uh, just for the general healing uh, of the country from where we are now to where it would be just to have some signs of normalcy again. And, and baseball has in the past played a big role in that. And I hope it will. I'm sure it will once uh, we get uh, the corner turned and we get back to some sense of a normal lifestyle. And I will say, I, one thing that has been nice, and you know this, uh, on your side of things with Fox Sports Net North and uh, the Twins uh, radio uh, network is uh, the Tw- Treasure Island Baseball Network has offered up to some of these classic games. And you and I, as historians of baseball, I've really enjoyed that. And I'll be honest with you because we had the 87 World Series on KFG over the weekend, and I didn't really... Uh, we all kind of watch it, right? Just to be in the World Series, you probably watch TV more because with Al Michaels and, and Tim McCarver, I caught most of that. But for me to relive it, listening to the classic Herb Carneal's voice and also John Gordon was really a lot of fun. Well, and beyond that, uh, in in uh, on the radio side, uh, they went back to game one of the 1965 World Series. Now, I was a nine-year-old kid back then, and they uh, ran on the radio network the TV feed. And so I was pl- uh, privileged to listen to, and back then they had the l- local announcers do the national broadcast. Wow. So I heard Ray Scott representing the twin side and Vin Scully, the Dodger side. And it, it wasn't a perfect radio broadcast because it was a television, uh, television audio put out over the radio. But just to hear those two iconic voices working together at Metropolitan Stadium was was a treat, not just for a broadcaster, but I think for anybody who was listening. Yeah, we'll have that coming up here on KFG over the weekend, too, so I'll, I'll tease that even more as we come along here. That is fun. You know, speaking of looking back, uh, your book, uh, uh, Game Use, is out there now, and I'm sure you know a lot of bookstores are closed right now, but you can still get that online, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, we, as our family's kind of been self-quarantined here, uh, we were going back and forth from um, our cabin just to check on that and came back 
uh, picked up an order at the Barnes and Noble in St. Cloud, and it was still open. I think the Barnes and Nobles, frankly, are doing uh, remarkable business because uh, people, uh, and maybe this is a sliver of a silver lining, people are rediscovering the joy of reading books. Yeah. But uh, the uh, Barnes and Noble in, in St. Cloud had the book on the front uh, display in the front window. So it's available in bookstores online at barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. And, you know, I, you know, Derek, I think you and I have talked about this, you know, when when I finally was coerced into going ahead with this project from uh, Triumph Books in Chicago, the thing that cinched it for me is I had to write it the way I wanted to write it, which was to make make it a self-deprecating, lighthearted look at my career and my experiences over the years with the twins. And how ironic that here the book was released last week uh, in the midst of one of the more somber uh, episodes in our nation's history, but it's out there. And if it uh, in any way, shape or form can help fill a void that uh, we're all experiencing, not having the twins play on the field, well, I guess maybe that's an added benefit. You know, if it fi- makes you feel good, the uh, voice of UND hockey, Tim Hennessy said he has it. And that's what he's been doing to, you know, bide his time here during this whole time. So, I mean, you got that going for you. another radio guy saying that he's really enjoying it too. And you know, I'm in the middle of it and I've really enjoyed it because you- you're right. I mean, I think people can write books, but I think to have it from the perspective of of being there and also coming in as a fan, it's a little unique because it's pretty unique. I think wouldn't you agree that you grew up being a fan and then you end up being the voice of the twins? It's it's got to be quite fun and humbling that way too. It's one of the great blessings of my life because I've referenced the 1965 twins even before that. I am just barely old enough to have memory of the first twins game ever played. And that uh, Bob Allison hit the first home run as the Twins beat the Yankees at Yankee Stadium in 1961. I mean, mean, my link to this organization goes all the way back to its very first day as a fan. And then, of course, I followed the team through my adolescence uh, early in my career, never imagining that for nearly 40 years now I'd be a broadcaster for the team. So that was uh, really the, the, the central reason why I wanted uh, or I agreed to write the book is I wanted it to be, in addition to being a a self-deprecating memoir, to be a bit of a twins history book, because in one or from one perspective or another, I was around to see it all. No, that's for sure. And I think what I like about it too is you talk about, you know, the the, the, the twins are kind of interesting because wouldn't you agree? I mean, when there's been highs, there's been highs. And when there's been lows, there's been lows. You've had some long summers too, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it hasn't been all world championship seasons or anything like that. But, you know, I I think, you know, one thing that uh, people will conclude or be reminded of uh, when they read the book is this franchise, although it plays its games in the Twin Cities, it is maybe in terms of geographic area covered, it might be the greatest a regional franchise in Major League Baseball because it is, it is you know, a, a very popular team in North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin, up into Canada. And the, the reach, uh, Twins territory, if you will, uh, back in the early years actually reached all the way out through the Rocky Mountains. There wasn't a team in Denver. There wasn't a team in Seattle. In fact, the uh, early Twins, like Earl Batty, told me that when they went out on the caravan, they would go all the way up to Alaska. That's how significant the move from Washington to Minnesota was back in 1961. It gave this entire region uh, a reason to follow more closely Major League Baseball, something they could only do prior to that from a distance. And so, again, that was one of the reasons I wanted to do the book, just to kind of make it a Twins history book. I'm sure you hear that a lot, too, right? I mean, I'm guessing you get letters from Montana and you know, you know Wyoming, all parts of the world, because it is such a big part of, you know, I guess, their lives throughout the summertime. One of the great things about the technological world that we live in, Derek, is that now fans who are fans of the Twins from Utah, I just got a text from a Twins fan in Utah the other day, uh, you know, Seattle, Tennessee, wherever, it's so much easier now to follow the team you want to follow. I, you know, when and I talk about it in the book, when we moved to Missouri from western Minnesota in the mid-60s, Of course, I became a Cardinal fan. They went to the World Series in 67 and 68. But it was difficult to maintain my Twins fandom because, you know, it was was hard. The Twins were on the game of the week twice a year on a Saturday afternoon. I had to wait till after sunset to take my sister's transistor radio out to the porch 
and catch the, uh, the, the Twins radio broadcast uh, from WCCO through WHO in Des Moines and eventually down to me in central Missouri. It's so much easier to be a fan of a team regardless of where you live now. I don't think there's any doubt that tech, you know, when we look at this, I think Major League Baseball might be doing a lot of technological things to help out the fans, too, knowing that baseball might heal. Wouldn't you agree? Because, I mean, I know a lot of people that probably watch you on their phone, right, <laughs> all over the country. So. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's that's where we are right now. If you're, it used to be, uh, you know, farmers still do this, of course, but they'll talk about listening to the game uh, while they're, um, you know, in their tractors or on their tractors. Well, now the fact of the matter is, if you want to, and you got to watch where, you know, you're driving uh, as you do on a highway, but if you wanted to watch the Twins games while you're on your tractor, you can do that too. It's amazing. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, sports in general have exploded over the last 10 years. It's just so much easier to, uh, you know, watch the games than it used to be. Well, you're talking about technology. They're watching it because they got the GPS steering the tractor for them. And that's well, what... that's true. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> There's no lie. But, you know, I, I was talking to Dan Gladden about this, and you know this, even you're on, even though you're on the TV side. It is still one of the, you know, fishing, farming, whatever, whatever it might be. And I think, it, would you, do you hear this a lot, too? I think people kind of go bounce in outside and outside in the summer so they get to hear both you and Corey a lot. I mean, it's, and I know I'm guilty of that as much as anyone. I do that a lot. Well, I mentioned last weekend, I sat, I've got an antique radio here in my office, and I just sat there for innings of just enjoying listening to something that that radio may have broadcast uh, back in 1965, you know, a, a, a baseball game. There is something special about baseball on the radio, at least for those of us who grew up in that era. Back then, you know, as a little kid, there were 50 games on TV. And four of them were home games. The rest of them were road games. And then uh, you, if the games weren't on TV, if you love the game, if you love the, the team, as I did, you listen to the games on the radio. And, uh, you know, now it's, you know, a multimedia experience. You can do both pretty much every game for the last several years. Now, every Twins game has been on television on one medium or another. And so it's just made it a lot easier to be uh, an avid fan. And that's, again, you know, circling back to where we are now, that's one of the really sad things about this because people have grown to expect Twins baseball or whatever team you follow to be a part of your daily schedule this time of year. And unfortunately, we're not there yet. Yeah, it's a uh, well tough times. Hopefully, it does come back soon. Hopefully, you get back to work soon. Until then, uh, hey, read uh, Dick's book. It's game use. It's very good. I'm in the middle of it right now. And again, BarnesandNoble.com. Stop by for the bookstores that are open right now during this COVID nineteen crisis. And again, we'll talk to you next week, Dick. I do appreciate it as always. All right, let's hope that uh, we'll get better news between now and next Tuesday. Yes, for sure. Looking forward to it. Dick Bramer again, the television voice of the Minnesota Twins. Twins Wrap brought to you by Jefferson Lines, serving North Dakota and the greater upper Midwest for over 100 years.